Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to our final Writing to Publish class of 2018. Um, my name is Amanda Flower. I'm the author of Residence here at the library, and I just want to let you know about another writing program that we have that goes on throughout the year. It's called Hudson Writers, and it's a critique group that meets the last Wednesday of every month except December at 7 p.m. in the library cafe. So if you're interested in that, you can come see me afterwards. It's my distinct pleasure, however, to uh, introduce my friend Vivian Chen as our speaker this evening. She will be speaking about the year in the life of a debut author. Vivian started writing simple stories about adventure with her classmates when she was in elementary school. And she is the author of the Noodle Shop Mystery Series, including Death by Dumpling and Dim Sum of All Fears. She currently lives in Cleveland, where she writes side by side with her toy fox terrier, which I think he makes an appearance on her presentation today. And the Learned Owl, if you're interested, is here selling her books after the program. Join me in welcoming Vivian. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I'd also like to thank Amanda um, in the Hudson Library and I'd like to thank Kate from the Learned Owl for being here tonight. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys about this and I've had a little bit of time to think about it because Amanda asked me to do this a while ago. But in uh, true Vivian style I procrastinated until the last minute and so we're just gonna wing it tonight. Um, which is usually, it goes pretty well. Um, so I'm going to talk about my first year as a debut author. Um, it has been a whirlwind. It's, it's not exactly what you think. Um, it's not all glamour. Um, it does not make your whole life better. But it does help with um, a lot, especially if you have dreamed of being a writer like I have. So um, we will start with the first slide, which there's my dog. Her name is Sasha. Everybody always asks me, you know, what does your dog look like? And they want to see what she is, and my face is always up there. So I thought I would add some little, little doggy goodness. Um, the reason why I put this up here is not really for you guys to actually read it. Um, it was just to show you, you have to write that yourself, <laughs> which is not as easy as you would think it would be. Um, when I first wrote my, uh, my bio, I thought, what do I really have to say about myself? I'm just your average bear. I don't have a fancy degree. Um, I didn't win any awards yet. So what I did was I used some basic information about myself. Because one of the things I think is important is that the reader actually knows you as a person. And they're, you know, some important things that you should know about me, like I really like donuts. <laughs> um, when, I, when I first started writing, I did uh, dabble in different genres. A lot of the reason why I did that is because when I uh, was growing up, I had a big fascination with the paranormal, and I decided that that's what I was gonna do. I read Anne Rice when I was 16 and fell in love and realized that this is, I want to do this with my life. I want to write stories. I want to take people someplace different. And I did. I wrote, well, it started out as a horror novel. And that did not go very well because I couldn't get the fear factor in there. So I kind of put it to the side and I thought, well, maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I need to learn more. So that's uh, kind of what I did is I just studied writing in general. Um, and I always kept the story to the side. And I went through. Uh, chick lit for a little while that bombed very badly and then I did um, a mystery class in college which I didn't know was going to be a mystery class and I ended up falling in love with it and I realized this is it this is what I want to do it's mystery so I put together a story that we had to write for class it was a short story assignment we got it on the first day and we had to have it ready by the end and I thought, well, I can't do this. I can't do this at all. I've never, you know, done mystery before, but I love it. So I'm going to give it a shot. So I wrote a PI novel, which I hope sees the light of day one day. But um, that's kind of where it all began for me. 
um, and it led me to this point. So whatever phase that you may be in in your own writing, never rule anything out. I think that that's really important when you're first starting out because you never know what opportunities are going to come up. Um, always expand your horizons as a writer because I think it makes for better writing. Um, you kind of see all the different aspects. Each genre kind of focuses on a different element of the story. Um, so it kind of, you know, it helps round you out. So that's a little bit of background on me. Okay, and these are my lovely book covers. Okay, so as you'll notice, I have the dates underneath. The reason why I did that is to show you guys a kind of timeline of how things work. The first book came out in March 2018, which is this year. I started this process in 2015. So because of the way that it started, it probably took a little bit longer than normal. Um, but it does take quite a while to get into the publishing flow. I started the synopsis, which is horrible. I hate synopsis, it's the worst. But I started that in 2015, and then I waited to hear back from the publisher. Beginning of 2016, I believe, is when I heard back. It was in March, um, and it was a very special day for me that it happened the way that it did, because it was the anniversary of my grandmother passing away. So normally, I don't go to work that day. I take the day off. Me and my father, we go to the cemetery. And we just, you know, we honor her. We bring flowers. We have lunch. We call it a day. So that day, you know, it had been several years. And I thought, well, maybe I'll go to work today. Just see what happens. I immediately regretted it. It was awful. I didn't want to be there. I felt bad. I should go to the cemetery. So we had um, breaking weather that day. All the snow had melted. It was maybe like 77 degrees, which is, you know, amazing mid-March. So my employer was feeling especially generous that day. We had a company meeting, and he said, you guys can all go home. I said, this is great. I'm going to go to the cemetery and I'm gonna call my dad. We're just going to, you know, hurry up, get there, do the flower thing, and I'll feel better. When I got back to my desk, I had a bunch of missed text messages and calls from my agent telling me to hurry up and call her because she had to tell me some really great news. And when I called her back, she told me that I got my very first book deal. It is the most amazing feeling. I don't even know how to describe it. The, the validation that I did it and this huge publishing company chose me to write for them. Never in a million years would I have ever thought that was going to happen to me. A lot, I think a lot of people, especially with artistic interests, want to steer, you know, kind of like steer you practically. They want to say, yeah, don't quit your day job. Maybe you should find something more, you know, like stable, something that's going to get you a stable income, which definitely is very important, especially when you're first starting out, because you don't know, you know, when is your next check going to come? When is your next book deal going to come? How is it even going to do? Is it going to bomb? You don't know these things, so you do. You need a backup plan. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of disbelief in yourself. Can I actually make this work? Can I do this? All you can do is try. So that's how we got to Death by Dumpling. And it was a very long process at first. When I got the deal in 2016 and they told me that my book wasn't going to come out until 2018, I thought, oh my god, I'm never going to make it. How is it, you know, how is this going to be? I'm going to be working on this book and I'm just waiting, 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 I'm waiting for it to be on the shelf. You just want to see it come to life. Well, it goes by faster than you would think. Um, so I started the writing process. It was over before I knew it, and I was turning it in. So about, I would say about a year before it actually comes out is when I turn it in. And then it goes through the next process. Oh, this I forgot about this part. That's what happens when you do things on the fly. So let me go through this really quick and then I'll backtrack. So when you, when you get involved in this, I recommend personally always having an agent. 
There's a lot of people out there that aren't sure and they hear a lot of horror stories about having agents and there are plenty. Uh, my agent is a phenomenal woman. She is my number one cheerleader. I have that up there. She's a negotiator for me. She um, handles all the legal aspects of it. She, um, she used to be an editor, so she kind of sees both, si you know, both sides of the spectrum from it. So she knows what she's looking for. Um, she has the experience, and she knows what's in my best interest as well. And she's also my advisor, because I talk to her about you know, what's the game plan. It's not just about getting out one book. It's about creating a career for yourself. Because um, ultimately, you do want to keep it going. I mean, most people, some people I think I've run across, they say, I just want to write one book and one and done. Um, that's not me. <laughs> um, so next you'll have your editor, which they are supposed to be absolutely the person that is going to make everything shine about your book. They will tell you things you don't want to hear. And you just have to accept that. Because um, you, you do, you have a hard time. You know? You're putting yourself out on the line uh, with something that's very personal that you've worked on a very long time. So you're hearing somebody say, mm, no, no, not, this is not good. But it is in your best interest, um, at, at least for me. I have heard horror stories in that department too. Um, I heard, I was actually listening to a podcast this morning and somebody was saying, well, I didn't really like my editor. I don't have that problem. I don't know how many of you guys have ever seen that Discover commercial where they call in and they're talking to themselves. That's me and my editor. That's us 100%. The copy editor is the person who is going to go over the fine tuning of your manuscript. So your editor is going to go over it and they're going to make recommendations for the story. She's not going to necessarily look for typos or fix your commas. I keep saying she, it could be he. Um, they are going to overall story. Where's the holes? What happens, you know, in the, in the book is, is a general outline. The copy editor is going to be the person who does all of that. Well, I didn't realize that when I first started. So I got my copy edits back, or I'm sorry, I got my regular edits back, and I'm, I'm finding all these typos, and I'm like, what the heck? I didn't realize that there was this other stage where this specific person was going to do this. So you end up reading your book four to five times, and by the time that you're done with it, you really don't like it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the marketer will handle all your book promotions, um, and then the publicist will handle a lot of... Um, like events, um, I recently just did a book fair. She coordinated the whole thing. I just sign my name, say yes, and she took care of it. Um, some, it, it, that's not to say that a publicist is exclusively going to do that for you. You're gonna uh, you know, be approached yourself um, and you're gonna coordinate your own events as well. So I, probably it's been about a 50-50 with my publicist. I didn't even know I had a publicist. So, you know, I, I still think of me as me. I'm, I'm not a person that is overly, well, I have a book deal, and I have this, and I have that. I've never been that type of person. So I was just happy, you know, I have an editor. I'm like, cool, you know? And then I found, you know, I was asking my editor something, and she's like, oh, well, I'll introduce you to your marketer and your publicist. And I was like, I have a publicist? That, that's pretty cool. Okay, so here's more back, we're going back to the process. So, writing to perfection. When you first are writing this, you know, this story from start to finish, you want to write it to the absolute best of your ability. You will soon realize that it is not the best of your ability after you get it back and see all of the red. So that's where the revisions from your editor come from. So the editorial letter, my first one was really scary because you don't know what to expect. I think that I emailed my agent the minute that I got the um, envelope and I was freaking out. She's like, you gotta calm down, it's, this is normal. And she's like, you know, I have you know, authors who have several books in their series and they have you know, 14 pages of edits. 
because I did have 14 pages of edits. Mm -hmm. It was very upsetting. So I got the, so the way that they, they set it up is the beginning part is a letter saying, you know, what they like about the book and what things as a whole need to improve. Then after that part, it's all the stuff that you've got to fix. And then all the stuff after that is the line edits. So it'll have a page number and it'll have, you know, this sentence, you need to change this. So this is where things get funny. Mm -hmm. I have down up there, I have the 24 hour meltdown. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not exclusive to me, but this is not, you know, something that everyone would go through, but it is something that I went through and I wanted to note it because it sticks in my mind. And with, I did the same thing with the second book and I did the same thing with the third book. So what happens is I get the editorial letter and I totally freak out. There's, there's no two ways about it. So I get it and I'm like, what? No, this is fine. Why do I have to change this? This is ridiculous. Oh my God, this stinks. Just all over. So there was a line in my first book that I was absolutely in love with and it was said by Detective Adam Trudeau, who's a handsome fellow in case you guys didn't know. So I had him say this line to Lana, and I thought it was hysterical. I mean, I was laughing at myself. <laughs> and I got the, the edits back, and my editor said, you have to take this out. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? My favorite line of the whole book, the whole book, OK? All however many pages, 302 pages, I don't even know, that was my favorite line. And she said, no. She said it was bad because it made him look like a jerk and she was worried that people wouldn't like him. And I said, okay, I can kind of see that. Then I was like, no, I can't, this is hysterical. <laughs> and I asked everybody that I knew, I, you know, so for, of course I call my dad, but what, your parents in this process are kind of worthless because they're gonna tell you that everything that you write is gold. I mean, they're just, you know what I mean? And that's, a, I mean, that's a good parent, you know? They're like, yeah, you can do whatever you put your mind to, and this is a great sentence. So I, I read it to my dad. I said, dad, read this. Tell me this is not funny. And he just, he looked at me and he was like, that's funny. <laughs> and I'm like, do you, do you really think so then? And he was like, yeah. And I'm like, because my editor thinks that it'll make him look like a jerk. And she's like, no, 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 not at all. So then I asked all of my friends. I asked my coworkers. I asked everybody I knew. I might have even emailed Amanda and asked her. Just, it was my favorite line. So that will happen. When you're working with an editor, they're gonna tell you things that you absolutely do not wanna hear. There are gonna be lines that you don't want cut out. You're gonna have to cut them out. You just have to do it. Cause I, well, I trust her. I trust her wholeheartedly and I feel like she wants my book to you know, to soar. She, she's not going to guide me in the wrong way because, you know, her name's also attached to that. So you just have to come down and, and trust it. They also may cut some characters, too. Um, that's also upsetting. <laughs> um, I had a character who's a very, she, she gets mentioned. Um, her name is Nikki. She is a very minor character. I wanted her because I feel like everyone has that friend that always says things at the wrong time. Super embarrassing. So I don't have her in most of the book, but there's a bar scene where Lana and Detective Trudeau are discussing something and Nikki comes along and she says something really embarrassing. And again, I think it's hysterical. I am laughing, I'm like, oh, Vivian, you're so funny. <laughs> and she wanted me to cut her out. She, you know, and she said, well, she doesn't really serve an actual purpose in the story. And I said, well, no, but she's funny. And like, everyone has that friend, so I feel like they'll get it. And then they'll read it to themselves and they'll laugh and they'll think, ha, I have a friend and her name's Melissa and she's just like that. But ultimately, you know, it's true. She didn't serve a purpose. She has some mentions in the books, but you never actually meet her. Maybe I will give her um, a spot in a later book, but so far every time that she comes up, she gets cut out. She just, she's not a fan favorite. 
So after, you know, after you calm down, so, and that's what I learned the first time. So when someone, you know, you get these things, they have to tell you this stuff, it's business. It's not personal and they're doing it for, you know, for you. So after the 24, I read the letter. So this is what happens, I read the letter. Usually I'm drinking coffee. The third book kind of escalated. Cause I was, you know, I was nervous and I was like, oh, what is this? So I had whiskey that time. <laughs> But so I start with coffee, and I sit down and I read everything from front to back. Well, now they're sending it to me digitally, so now I'm reading the screen. And then I think about it, and I'm, everything is wrong. I don't want it to be this way. Why do, I, sometimes I think I'm gonna sneak something in. And I think, I'm gonna put this in here, and she's not even gonna notice, and then she does. So, um, I'll just read it and then I'll go over it. I'll throw my tantrums and I'll go to sleep that night. I'll wake up the next day and decide she's absolutely 100% right about everything. And I will change it all and we will get it worked out. So that's, you know, beware of that when you get to that point because you are going to hear things you don't want to hear. You know, I'm still, I'm still mad about that line. Okay, so copy edits. Look out for death breath because I just wrote that in a story and did not catch it. It went past three different eyes. No one caught it. My copy editor caught it. Thank God for her. Um, you just make silly mistakes. So when I, when, I first, when I did the first book, I thought, okay, well, I have a copy editor, so I'm good. You, you could just, you know, just leave it. No, don't leave it. Because they're not just working on your book, they have other books too, and you want to make sure you catch it all. You still, there's always that word, it just shows up. And I've had people, and people will email you about that word. I've had people, I found a typo in your book. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't do anything at that point, you know? So um, we appreciate your efforts, but it's too late. <laughs> um, and then the final proofs, so that is when it's, and this was an exciting thing for me because it started to look like a book. So they have it printed out on um, eight and a half by 11 or eight and 11 and a half, whatever, you know, the thing. So they have it on the paper and then it's, you know, it looks like a book. So like I would fold it and stuff like a dork because I was like, this is my book. So still, you know, you get, this is your last chance. This is it. Because once you say, and you can't make any actual changes, it's very small stuff, a typo. If you hate a sentence, too bad it's staying. You know, so there's a lot of things that just have to stay. But I found two chapter 23s in, in uh, I think that was in Dim Sum of All Fears. So um, look for that for sure. And I pause for a minute because I, while I'm talking about dim sum of all fears, I want to bring that up. So another thing that can happen is that they will change your book title. Um, and it's really not up to you unless you're probably Stephen King or James Patterson or one of those big shot guys. Um, so when I first uh, made, I made the titles, well, they were recommendations from the publishing company. And I based the books off of the title. So I picked, there were six things that I could pick. So I picked Death by Dumpling, because that's a given, like who, you know, what's gonna happen there. Hot and Sour Suicide and Murder Low Main. So I started writing Hot and Sour Suicide. I was really excited about the story um, because I made a joke about Hot and Sour Soup um, comparatively to two women in the story. It was funny. And I believe it lived. It lived on in the, in the book. So if you read it, you can enjoy that little chuckle to yourself. Um, so, I, you know, I had based it on the title. I'm like, this is how it's going to go. Then they said, we don't like the title anymore. And it was a controversial, something had just happened in the news. A lot of suicide things going on. And I agree. I, so I wasn't really comfortable with the title either, in a, in a sense. I picked it because I knew the joke right away. I knew that, you know, there was going to be these two women that were like hot and sour soup. And it amused me thoroughly. So I, I kind of, 
I kind of moved around the whole suicide aspect. If you guys read the book, then you'll get it. But I could get where they were coming from. You know, it was, it's very controversial at this point with all the things that were going on in the media. So they changed it and they said they were gonna make a dim sum of all fears. And I was like, my book is not about that. Um, so I worried about it. Everybody else loved it. Everybody thought it was so great. Oh my, that's so clever. Like the sum of all fears. And I was like, yeah, but my book's not about Russian things or spies. And I got really upset and you know, and they were telling me don't worry about it because that's, you know, it's okay if the, if the title doesn't necessarily match the book. And it just bugged me. But then when people, it, the word got out and people were like, dim sum of all fears, that's great. And I was like, yeah, it is. Totally is. And I loved it. And I love it now. And again, it was a good choice. Um, I've had people stop me at you know, a book convention to tell me that they love the title. They have no idea what the book is about, but they love the title. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's a good title. It is. But I'll never take credit for it because I'm not that clever. So um, that, that's all on them. But so these things can change a lot. And you never really know what to expect, so you have to keep an open mind and think, you know, go with the flow, see what happens. It might work out better than you originally thought, and, it, and I personally think that it did. So galley copies, people call these things all kinds of stuff. ARCs, advanced reader copies, galley copies. Um, that is an amazing feeling as well. And I didn't realize that, I've seen other people's um, some of my friends would show me theirs, and they have a blank cover, you know, and it has the name, and it's, it's not fully completed. Well, mine was fully completed, and it had a little starburst on it that said advanced reader copy, but it had the cover. And I didn't know that they were sending it to me either, so I got it in the mail, and I had to go, I live in an apartment, so I have to get everything through the apartment office. And I got the book, <coughs> Well, I didn't know what it was, okay? So I got the book, and I have it in the envelope, and I opened the envelope, and I sat in my car. I made a video, you guys. Like, I seriously made a video, and you can hear me sniffling in the back because my best friend, she lives in California, and I wanted to share this moment with her since she couldn't be with me, so I made a video of the cover, and, I, like, you can hear in the background of the phone. What a dork. You guys, I'm such a dork. So, you know, and I flipped through the pages, you know, I did the whole fan thing, and then I, you know, focused in on the back. Such a dork, yeah. But that, so, you, so you get that, and you get to see what it looks like, and it's the first book of yours that you will ever hold is the most amazing feeling in the world, because you did it, and there's the proof. And I have that copy, and it's sitting on my shelf, and every once in a while, I'll just, like, touch the cover. It's really dorky. Okay, so... We're gonna move on to the promotional aspects because it also is where a lot of the funny, the, the fun, well, you could say funnier, funnier or funner stories. Um, a lot of interesting things happen. So the first thing that I will advise anybody in here um, is that if you are going to do this, how many of you guys are writing a story right now? Oh, a lot of you guys. Um, how many of you guys have a website right now? Yeah, not so many, not so many. Okay, how many of you guys like donuts? <laughs> I just did that for fun. Okay, so, my advice to you is make a website. It's horrible. I waited until the absolute last minute. I have everything else. I have Instagram. I have Twitter, I have a Facebook fan page, I have a regular Facebook page. I have a Pinterest, I have it all. Except for Tumblr, I'm not into that. But I had all of these things and I, you know, the day that I got my contract, I made all of this stuff. But I refused to make a website because it scared me. I'm not uh, technologically advanced and so it really made me nervous to make a website, it was gonna look stupid, I was gonna embarrass myself, I had no idea where to start, so I did a lot of research first. And I kinda just then forgot about it, conveniently. So then, after a while, my agent noticed, and she said, hey, 
where's your website at? I was like, oh, yeah, I'm totally working on that. I'm getting it up and running. I was like, oh, God, I better hurry up and, and do this before she realizes that I'm lying. So <laughs> I, got the, um, I got the website started. I, I bought the domain name, which always just make it your name, something simple, um, so that it's easy to find. I'm VivianChen.com. That's it. Um, so I bought that. Oh, in a word to the wise, when you're doing this, because I didn't know this, I feel silly, but you have to, at least I used Bluehost, um, you have to put in the www, because if you don't actually say that, then they're not going to put it there. And then I felt like I was missing a piece of my leg. So I contacted them and you know, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't realize what I was doing and I wanted to have the W's in the front because people get weird and they're like, I couldn't find your thing and you know, I put in the W, it was strange. So she's like, well, don't worry about it. It will route anyways, it'll find it. And I was like, but I really want it. So just keep that in mind um, and also recommend it. Always make it a dot com. Don't make a dot net, dot org. I don't know why you would make it an org, but just don't make it any other things. Make it a dot com. I told myself that any time that I would talk to people about promotional things, or anything that they were going to do that I would immediately tell them to make a website. Do it. Go home tonight, get Bluehost, whoever, and make a website for yourself. Because this is going to be your home base. This is where people are going to find you. I can't believe how many, and I really don't have a lot on my website. If you guys want to look tonight, you can when you leave. I don't have a lot on there, but I have my book, and I have links to all of my uh, social media. Um, I have a contact page. I have my bio. Um, I'm supposed to have events on there, but I'm horrible at updating. I told myself I'm going to get better at this. But you would be surprised at how many people contact you through your website. So many people. Um, also, what you want to do is attach all of your social media onto your website or have links to something so that they can go to your other stuff too. Because not everybody is going to be into Facebook. Not everyone's going to be into Instagram um, or Twitter. Um, I find that Twitter is very big on writers, not so much on readers. So you can make a lot of writer friends if you go on Twitter, but I think you get a, a bigger fan base on Instagram and on Facebook. Pinterest is kind of an odd concept for this. Uh, my agent really wanted me to get into having a Pinterest board, which I love to pin things. I mean, I could waste my entire life on there. You'd never see me again. How come Vivian hasn't come out with a book? I don't know, she's on Pinterest. So what you can do with that is you kind of make, well, I, you have a board for your books, obviously, you have that. And then you also want to have interests. So for me, I have a lot of Asian things on there. I have Asian food, I have Asian establishments, Asian clothes, and then of course I have dog stuff, and then there's food things, and everyone loves donuts, so we got that going. Mm -hmm. So you can really do a lot with it, but you, you, know, you come across other people and you know, promote writing on it and all kinds of things. So it's a lot of fun, but most importantly, have your website. Okay, so Facebook and Twitter banners. Um, sometimes a publishing company will do that stuff for you. Mine did. Um, but you can try and create your own, and there's a lot of different like templates so that you can see the size and you don't get cut off and it's weird looking. Um, the 80-20 rule. So when when, they're, when you're first starting out, I think that a lot of people just really want to promote themselves. And they want to, and I was the same way. You want to talk about, you have a book coming out, and this about your book, and your book, and your book, and your book. No, stop. It has to be 80-20. With really the 80 being about you and interests, and 20 being about your book. Because you don't want to flood people People get annoyed, especially in recent times. There's been a lot of uh, upset over Facebook ads and you know everything going on with that. So you want to make sure that you're not, you know, all day long. Buy my book. Don't do that. Just be you. Be yourself. Um, I've met a lot of interesting people on social media talking about noodles. 
Um, some lady, you know, from Australia messaged me and asked me, you know, did I, could I recommend some type of like recipe, which I can't. Um, <laughs> not of my own, and we'll, and we'll talk about that too when I get into the more personalized experiences. Um, but try and, you know, make things, what do you like? What kind of, or what kind of things are your books about, you know? Um, I will use Amanda as an example because she's in the room and she's my friend. So I'm going to use her, but like, you know, she's super into cats. So like, there's cat stuff on her page, you know, and like, they're adorable. So I don't know if you guys have checked her out, her, like her Facebook stuff, but check it out because they're cute, right? I've never seen cats like this. <laughs> never. They're so fun. I'm like, wow, what? my dog will not do anything. I'm like, do something. She won't do anything. Every once in a while I can get her in an outfit, but I mean, she just lays there like a lump. I'm like, all right, just sit there. And you know, I like put my cover flat on her body. I'm like, don't move. And that was it. That was as good as she got. And sometimes like she'll put up her ears, but. So anyways, Amanda has great cats and she talks about her cats and you know, it personalizes her. Um, you know, and I'll try to talk about well, I talk about my dog, or I'll post pictures when I go to restaurants. Um, and for me, I feel like that's a two-part two. You really get to know people in the community. And I want to support local business. So I'll go to you know local places, and I'll be like, hey, try this place out. You know, so it's fun for you, and it's fun for them, because maybe they were thinking about you know, going someplace, and because you said something, now they're like, oh, this, this person, they like this, I like this. You know, I just went to uh, Mad Max in Lakewood, which I'm, you know, from a different part of town. But this place is amazing. The whole menu is macaroni and cheese. This made my day. But, you know, so I posted about that because it, you know, it's something that I did. It doesn't always have to be about your book, you know, and it kind of makes people know you. And then somebody started talking to me about mac and cheese. So now I'm having, you know, it's crazy. I just... That's not the things that you really think that you're going to talk about with people, you know, so it's really surprising. Business cards. This was, this was a very fun conversation that I had with everyone that I knew. Do you get a business card? Some people said yes, yeah, some people said no. Nobody wants your business card, Vivian. It's just another piece of junk, you know, to put in their purse or spit their gum out in. Not true. Not true. Get business cards. They are important. Put your website on it, also important. If you don't have a website, get a website and then put it on your business card. So my first major conference that I did was in um, Toronto. I went to a mystery convention called BoucherCon. And I, so double story, I'll tell you a little bit personal about me. Um, I s struggle with anxiety. And one of the things that I don't like to do is drive really far distances on really super crazy highways. So I said to myself, one of the, I have to start battling these things. I have to confront it. I have to get out there and face my fears and do whatever. So I'm going to drive to Toronto. This is the best idea I've ever had. So, you know, and everyone's freaking out. They're, Are you sure? Don't you want someone to come with you? And I was like, no, I need to do this for me. So I got in the car, and I was in Buffalo, and I thought, what did I get myself into? But it, I mean, it was really great. So I'm going to my first conference. I don't have a book out yet. I'm just going to hang out, meet people, socialize, pass out my new business cards that I got. Um, and I felt pretty sharp, too, because I got like this two-tone black and gray thing, and then I got the teal, and it mashed my hair, and I was like, I am slick, right? <laughs> so I was at the hotel. I had been there for a day, and I, I went outside, and I was in this area with a couple of people there, and this woman comes up to me, and she says, hi, what do you do? And I thought, this is odd. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm an author. And she said, oh, that's nice. Where's your business card? Well, I had just woken up. I was going to the donut shop. Like I went, they have Tim Hortons, you know, so I was going to Tim Hortons because everyone's like, you gotta go to Tim Hortons, man. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go. So I'm, 
like, I have my hoodie on. I'm in my pajamas. And she's like, where's your business card? And I said, ah, uh, mm, uh, and I pretended like uh, I'm looking. I know I don't have it, but I'm like, uh. And she said, um, no, you should always have your business card. Why don't you have your business card? And I said, well, I'm just, I'm going to the donut, and I was coming back with my coffee. I didn't have makeup on, I had my sunglasses on. I look like, you know, someone who's trying to hide from people. And she said, rule number one, you always have your business card. And I was like, ooh, she's serious. So I said, okay. I said, I got you. Well, can I have your business card? And she said, oh. I'm not a writer. I'm just a reader. I was like, whoa, this is a tough crowd. <laughs> so I went and got my honey glazed donut, and I went back to my room, and I have had a business card in my purse ever since. So follow-up to that, I saw the lady again the next day, and she said, hi, Vivian. How are you today? And I said, I'm well, thank you. I don't remember her name. And... She said, do you have your business card? And I was like, bam. She's like, very good. And I was like, wow, this is tough. I hope she buys my book now. So, lesson learned, always have a business card. Some people will tell you that it's really not that important. Everything's online. Uh, do it anyways, because there's going to be somebody, that lady is going to come at you. I mean, especially if you ever go to BoucherCon, because she told me she goes to all of them. So I was like, wow, OK. Book, bookmarks, posters, coasters, all the whole shebang. Um, some publishing companies will provide these for you. Uh, mine does not. Um, so I asked, you know, I felt a little embarrassed because I feel, and that's, you know, the title of this PowerPoint was The Rookie Author because that's what I tell everybody when I don't know something and they've been like, yeah. I'm like, well, I'm a rookie. I don't, I don't know. Um, they don't, um, they don't provide the bookmark because they feel that it, it doesn't help book sales, which probably is true. I, I don't know. I got them anyways because I have to have all of it. Um, you know, when you're new, you want all those things. Here's my bookmark. Here's my business card. Here's this coaster with my face on it. Like, you have it all. So... And I even, I, I tamp like, I thought about, like, magnets. I was like, ooh. And you put, like, my book on your refrigerator, and you always see it, and you'd be like, oh, Vivian, I miss you. And it would be great. But I didn't get the magnets. So I, I got the bookmarks. Fun fact about me, I don't read details. So I went on Zazzle, and I got bookmarks. And I thought, I was putting the, dis the, the description of the book on the back of the bookmark. And I thought, why is none of this fitting on here? Like, what is the problem? Is the font too big? I don't know. My father will always say, you need to read the instructions. Well, I don't. So I said, that's fine. I'll, I'll make the font smaller. And I kept making it smaller and smaller and smaller until I got it to fit. I finally, I was cutting words out. I was like, they don't need to know this part. I'll cut out this part of the book. So I finally get it. A week later, I get a box in the mail that's this big, okay? Two by three. What the heck is this? I didn't order this, so I open them and they are mini bookmarks <laughs> that are bookmark business cards. I've never heard of this in my life and I am appalled. What am I gonna do? 500, you guys, I ordered 500. <laughs> so embarrassing so of course then my dad was see this is why I told you you have to read the instructions so I you know I went back and I'm like outrage they didn't tell me I didn't how was I supposed to know I wasn't properly informed and then I went back and read it and said two by three oh I got a ruler out damn it <laughs> it was the worst so what I did was at my launch party I put them out as like confetti because you have to repurpose this. I mean, I paid this, you know, so I thought this is a good idea. And people love them. I was surprised. Um, I had, <laughs> at my launch party, I had, you know, Asian food, well, Asian desserts, and then I had 
donuts and everything. So my best friend knew this, and she sent me napkins with my book cover on it. So I thought, oh, okay, I got the napkins, and I got these little confettis. I'm going to decorate the table and put a lot. You wouldn't believe people were stuffing this stuff in their purse. They were like, some lady took like 20 bookmarks. She's like, I'm going to use all of these. I'm like, okay, take them all, please. So, and like napkins, they were, they were flying out of there, and, you know, it was crazy. <laughs> So you have to, you know, roll with the punches. Um, so later on, I was very more thorough in reading the descriptions, and I got properly sized bookmarks. No thanks to Zazzle. But I was like stalking yourself. I really did put that on there. I took that off, and I put it on. And I took it, I'm like, I'm going to leave it on. And so I left it on, apparently. Um, so reviews. So another thing that happens um, is reviews start to come out. I want to say that reviews started coming out for me like a month before my book actually hit the shelves because people were reviewing uh, the advanced reader copies and go on NetGalley, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. It's a very nerve-wracking situation, because I st and that leads into stalking yourself. So a lot of people, mostly big-name people, some small-name people, will say, do not read your reviews. Just don't do it. Don't look, don't stalk yourself, don't Google, never put your name in the search bar, never. Well, I can't do that. So, and especially with your first book, it's so hard because this is the first time the public is, is going to see your writing. And, it, you know, it's a representation of yourself and you want people to like you. So, as they have always said since the beginning of time, well, not everyone's going to like you. And that's very true. Um, so the reviews started coming out a month, a month before, and I got a, a lot of good reviews. And I actually, if I had given myself more time, I would have posted some of them up here so that you guys could see what they were like. Some of them were really nice. They were, it was amazing. I was reading these things about myself, and they were like, oh, she writes so well, and I feel like I'm talking to her, and this is great, and she's so funny, and ha, 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 it's great. And then came some not nice reviews. And those were really hard to look at because people are picking things apart. A lady said, I picked this book. I don't like Chinese food. But I decided to read it anyways. And I didn't like the book either. Probably not the best book to get considering there are dumplings on the front. So then I got upset about that. And I thought, what's this lady? She's giving me a bad review. She doesn't even like Chinese food, and now she gave me a two-star. What the heck? So now I'm mad about that. And my agent said, do not look at this stuff. I told you, don't look. And I was like, but I got to look. So every day I would, you know, I start my day, and I go on Google and just type in Vivian Chen and see what would happen, where I would find myself. It was terrible. So... <laughs> I just kept looking. There, you know, and you have some people who really, they're not happy with anything. Well, I didn't like the main character's name. So I'm going to give you a two star. Okay. And then you'll have some people who really get into it and they write paragraphs and they'll say, I really didn't like this because this happened and this was horrible and it just made me feel funny and I was going through a really rough time in my life when I read it and it upset me even more and now I hate the book. You're like, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about your... But then there's also a lot of nice things that have happened where a lot of nice people... Um, an Asian woman uh, somewhere across the country contacted me and said that it meant so much to her that I had written this book and had a mixed-race character because it was very hard to find. And she said that she loves mysteries. She fancies herself to be a Nancy Drew. And she worked in a Chinese restaurant. And she said, thank you very much. And that carried me for at least three hours. <laughs> Until I read the next review where they're like, I don't like anything about this and the dog is stupid. <laughs> Who doesn't like Kiko? And I, I'm sorry, but I think it's funny. And, and I have a dorky sense of humor. And when I told my friends that I was going to name the dog Kikoman, after soy sauce, so I could say black as soy sauce. They were like, you are such a dork. I'm like, yes, yes, I am. But, um, you know, you have these liberties that you can do in your book, and, like, why not, you know? So I, 
I feel, you know, have fun with it, put some of yourself in it, and just see what happens. And some people are going to like it, and some people aren't. There are some people who said they loved the exact same thing that other people hated. You can't win. You, so, you know, you just do you. you. You see what happens, and just try not to stalk yourself too much, though. So what happened was the, the reviews came out about a month, and I stalked myself religiously every single day. I was making myself sick. I mean, it just got to the point where I, was, I don't want this thing to come out. And I would say to everyone, can we forget it and just, like, don't, don't put it in the store. Well, it's too late now. You can't take it back. So I'm thinking, I'm going to run to Mexico, something. I'm just, I got to get out of here. But I kept looking, and I kept finding myself on stuff, and... You know, I was like, well, why? You know, and then it, it, it got a little too much because now more reviews are coming in. More people are finding the book, and there's so many things to look at. So launch day. Wait, hold on. Let me change the slide. I tend to ramble. Aha, launch day. I knew it was there. Okay, so launch day. I took off of work. If... If you're um, a full-time person, worker, day worker, and you get a book deal and your book is coming out, I recommend you take that day off of work because you are going to be what I like to refer to as a hot mess. <laughs> so the night before, I was freaking out because while you're working on books, and that, you know, and that's another thing that I, I wanted to point out and I forgot with the um, three, you know, showing you the three books with the three dates at the bottom. While you are releasing one book and doing something with one, you're also doing something with the next one, and maybe even the next one after that, depending on how your schedule is going. Because I have six months in between publication dates. I have roughly six to seven months to write the book itself. But you know, I've been fortunate to where we were in enough in advance where I could get extensions, um, which I always hate to ask for. But you know, you get to that point, and you're like, I got to. Um, so when I had, when Death by Dumpling was releasing, I was editing Dim Sum of All Fears. And it, you know, it was frustrating because I had screwed up a big thing in the book and I had to fix a considerable amount. And I just, you know, going crazy on the computer and a friend of mine emailed me and she said, I just wanted to congratulate you on your publication tomorrow. And I wanted to tell you to make sure to take some time for yourself because this is the only time that you will have a first release. And that hit me and I was like, you know what, she's right. I'm not doing this crap, I'm not doing it. So I put, I put uh, Dim Sum of All Fears away and I emailed my editor, my agent, someone, I, don't, I was emailing the whole world and I said, you know, I'm gonna take a break from this. I hope it's okay if I get like another, you know, day or so because I really wanna just enjoy my release. And they said, absolutely, do that. Take your day, do your thing. And I was like, okay. That night I couldn't sleep. I was like, what? So then in comes the whiskey again. So I'm like, let's, you know, let's get some rest. We got to get ready for the next day. But you don't want to overdo it because you don't want to miss the whole day and it's 11 and the whole world has started without you. Because the world does start really super early with the book stuff. I was surprised. People were posting about my book. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was like 8 a.m. And people were like, Death by Dumpling came out today and I already read it and here's my review and this is what I think. And I'm like, what? I don't even have my hair done. <laughs> so I was very ill prepared. And this photo here, I wish this had, I wish this had a light on it because I could be like zappy. <laughs> that photo. That took me three hours. How sad is my life? So what I did was I got, you know, I had this idea in my head. I had it for months, but last minute girl. So I had it for months and I got, you know, I, I got so excited because I bought the fan and I, I bought it like two months in advance. That's exceptional for me. So I had the fan, of course I have chopsticks laying all around. I had to buy a 15 pack of those takeout boxes. So if you guys need any, let me know, because I don't know what to do with them, like make my own food and like carry it around in the thing. I don't know. 
So I bought all that stuff. I bought the, you know, the flowers and everything, and I was really proud of myself, and I had it all in a bag, and I didn't do anything with it. I'm like, I got to do this, because Instagram is great. I love Instagram so much more than any of the, the other social media outlets, because there's no drama. There's pictures of cute things, and you can just heart it and be on your way. So that picture I did on my kitchen table. And I don't have a, a master setup or anything. I live in a two bedroom in Parma. Um, it's nothing special. And so I put it on the coffee table and I'm standing on my chair, I have a high top. And I'm standing on my chair taking pictures with my cell phone. I mean, dork status, secure. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing, and I'm taking all angles, and I'm taking like 50 pictures. I'm like, how's this one? How's this one? I'm texting my friend. I'm like, what do you think of this picture? And she's like, move the fan to the left and put it, you know, make the chopsticks, you know, lay kind of off to the side. And I was like, all right, we're going to do this. So we did. So she helped me, and it took me three hours. And I was like, I've wasted all this time to make one Instagram picture when I could have been doing so many more things, like just enjoying myself. So after the Instagram debacle, I then, you know, took some time, started reading the reviews, things were pouring in, people were congratulating me. It was a great, it was a great feeling to have it out there. So then my next adventure was to go to the bookstore because now this is your next feat. To see yourself on the, see yourself on the shelf. Wow. Okay, it was like a Dr. Seuss moment right there. Okay, so anyway, so you want to see yourself in the bookstore. So I was really excited. And we have two main bookstores uh, by us. Uh, Parma is lacking in the literary department as far as bookstores go. So I had uh, Books a Million in Fairview Park, which, funny enough, where the Books a Million is is where uh, Asia Village is located. I just moved everything out and put my stuff there. But so I was like, I'm going to go to Books a Million and I'm going to get my book. So I had my book in my purse. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't thinking anything of it. So I went to Books a Million and I know the manager because, yes, I do go there that often. And I know the manager, so I talked to him and I was like, hey, I was like, I'm just here, I'm here to get my book, and, uh, and he was like, oh, yeah, that's right, you said you were doing something like that. I was like, yeah, something like that. So <laughs> I go there, and I look on the shelf, and I'm not there. Mm -hmm. It was horrible, you guys, it was so horrible. So I got really upset, so I went, and I was like, I'm going to talk to the manager. So I went, and I was like, hey, where's my book? And he's like, what book? And I'm like, my book, Death by Dumpling book, that book, this book. And he said, oh, I don't think we got that. Did you contact Books A Million headquarters and tell them that you needed your book to be on the shelf? I was like, no, I, I didn't. I didn't think you had to do that. So I was so disappointed. And I was like, now what? I'm mad, so mad. So I got back in the car. And I called Barnes and Noble. I was like, hey, you guys, what's going on? Do you, and I didn't want to tell them who I was because I felt embarrassed. So I was like, do you have a book called Death by Dumpling by Vivian Chen? They were like, hold on, let me look. So they go do their thing, they find it, and they were like, yes, actually, we do. And I said, great, could you save me a copy? So they were like, yeah, no problem. And my dad wanted to go to the bookstore with me because he wanted to share in this moment. He kept going around telling everybody, I'm a proud dad. I'm a proud dad. I'm a proud dad. So I didn't want to take his moment from him. So I was like, okay. So I went out to eat with a friend. And that's where the next picture came from. And that picture was taken in five minutes. He has experience in photography. So it, it was no you know, pressure on him. He was like, yeah, just put it here and... Ching, there we go. There's your fancy dumplings, there's your book. I was like, all right, this was a lot easier than what I did earlier today, but I didn't tell anybody. You guys are the first to know this story, by the way. So anyways, I go, after I have my dumplings, I go pick up my father, and we go to Barnes & Noble in Westlake. And they have my book, and I was so excited. He was, you know, and they held it at the counter. And he said, let's, you know, let's go look on the shelf. So we went and we looked on the shelf, and it was on the bottom shelf in the corner next to Laura Childs, which I'm, 
I'm happy to be next to Laura Childs. She, I think she's a fantastic writer. And so I was like, yeah. Well, my dad was like, no, you need to be on the top shelf. So he moved all of my copies to the top shelf. <laughs> I'm sorry to the people and the A names, but my book went there. So um, it was an amazing day and it felt, it felt uh, unreal. I mean, it just, you know, you, you work on this. I was working on this for two years. And there it is on, you know, the shelf at Barnes & Noble. I'm like, I did it. I made it. This is great. And then I just wanted to go home. Because <laughs> it, it was, so, you know, but it goes by so fast. You know, that, and that's why I, I really recommend not waking up at 11 because you drank too much whiskey the night before because you couldn't fall asleep because then you miss all of it. Um, but it, it was a really amazing adventure. So my book came out. And then I think Easter was in there somewhere. We had an early Easter, and I wanted to have a launch party. And another good friend of mine um, is a librarian uh, for Twinsburg. And so she was going to have the launch party for me at her library. That's another thing that you want to be prepared for in advance. So she kept me on schedule because I think that had I been by myself on this, you know, we, we might be just having that party now. Um, so she, you know, she got it all done. So my advice to anybody who's going with a book, have a party of some type. It doesn't have to be crazy. You know, the library is a great place to have it, any library. Librarians are so supportive. Um, local bookshops are so supportive. Shout out to Kate in the back. Um, but really, <laughs> I'm so embarrassing, I really am. But, you know, I mean, the local people really care and they want to see, you know, they want to see you shine. And what better place to have it than in a library, you know? So I, I personally like, now a lot of people, they have them in stores. Um, some people have them in bookstores. Um, some people have them in restaurants uh, or cupcake places. I think I went to one at, um, I think it was like a, I don't know if it was a consignment shop or it was in Ohio City. Um, a friend of mine was doing a, a release and she had her launch party there and, she, you know, it, it fit with the book and everything. So, and she knew the people. So it went really well. My point is have a party, if not for your readers, but for yourself. So I said, I want a tower of donuts. I need it. Do you really? Yes, I do. So I used peace, love, and little donuts, and I got myself a tower of donuts. And I thought, it wasn't that much money. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't that bad. But it's not cheap either. So I had discussed this with a coworker of mine, and I said, what do you feel is this frivolous? Because I am a frivolous girl. So <clears throat> he said, absolutely, get a tower of donuts. This is your day. So I got a tower of donuts. It's not pictured there. I just wanted to see what was next. So you want to have a theme, too. Um, I think just because themes help, and I like them. Um, so my theme, obviously, I had Asian pastries and then donuts because I love donuts. And therefore, I made Lana love donuts. So I could talk about my donut obsession and spread the word. <laughs> um, the party was amazing. I have low expectations for myself at all times, which I feel is very important so you don't get your hopes up. Some people might call me a pessimist. I call myself a realist. Um, tonight when I came, I expected Amanda and Kate to be here with me. That is all. Um, for my launch party, same thing. I expected it to be me, my father. Um, Kate, you were there, right? Okay, so Kate was there. So Kate's always a factor. Um, and then who else? And of course my friend um, Carrie, who's the librarian there. So I really didn't expect a lot, and it turned out to be a little over 80 people. They ran out of seats, you guys. I was like, what? These people are here to see me? Some people were there for the pineapple cakes, I'm not going to lie. But that's okay, because that's how you lure them in. You're like, I'm here, look at my Asian pastries. And then they, maybe they stay. You know, so, um, but it was, it was a really great day and it was the first time that I had to get up in front of everybody and talk. And I thought it was just gonna be my dad. So I was like, this is no problem. 
And I just put, like, I jotted a couple notes on a piece of paper that I couldn't even look at. Because um, every time I looked down, I started shaking. I couldn't pick up the water bottle because it was like this. I mean, just, it was horrible. But it, it was a really amazing day, and I got to meet with a lot of great people. And, and that's part of the journey, too, of, you know, your debut year um, is meeting people, is talking with so many different people from various walks of life all over the country, um, some in other countries. I've had people reach out to me. Well, I had a woman reach out to me from Australia about the, the recipe, which is another thing that I will tell you guys about. And I had another woman say that her 90-year-old mother read my book recently, and she absolutely loved it. You know, and here I am. I, you know, I never met this person. I live in Cleveland, Ohio, and they're they're just coming to me and saying these things, and it's great. You know, and then you also have people contact you and be like, "What did you write? What is this? I don't understand. What are you doing with yourself?" I'm like, "Well, I don't I don't know either. I just wing it." So you know, do it. So that all ties in, like getting the word out for everything, especially like you're going to have parties. Um, for yourself. I just did a Facebook party um, with Lena Gregory uh, for her release and it had about 30, I think about 30 other writers and we all just posted something. Um, it was a lot of fun and very different than you know what I have seen before. It's not a new concept but it is something for people to think about because a lot of people really like to do a Facebook party. So basically what you do is you, you know you get a page going and you, you know you invite other people. You, I mean, you could do a Facebook party by yourself as well. It depends on how you want to do it. But she chose to have other writers with her and you know promote their writing and do something fun with it. So um, it was for her launch for her book, and everyone had slots of time that they would use. I think the slots of time were maybe 20 minutes or so. So. I had another obligation, so I only did, um, I think they called it the lightning round. I just did one post. Um, and of course my post was about donuts. So Lana um, uses that as her comfort food and I wanted to know what other people use as their go-to sweet and I did a giveaway with it. So, you know, you answer my, my post and then maybe I'll pick your name to win a book. And I thought to myself, no one is gonna care about me. Who am I? These other people, they're more established than I am. They have multiple series. They have multiple books. I have two out on the shelf and people are like, Vivian who? I was surprised. And I had so many comments. I was like, maybe 58 people commented on my one post. I mean, it was, it was pretty amazing. So, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do um, for your launch, you could do, you know, the giveaways and stuff. And of course, you could just do giveaways. You don't have to do a party. You could just say, hey, I'm giving away. People are like, giveaway. They don't even know, you know, sometimes what it's for. They just, they want to win something. I want to win something. I'm trying to win things all the time. Um, so you can do a lot of different things to promote your book. Um, also, Facebook ads. This is a touchy subject for many people. Um, a lot of people hate them. I don't know if they're helpful or not. The one thing that I did notice, uh, so I did um, a Facebook ad for my launch party. Two girls came out of the 80 that said that they saw me on Facebook. So I don't know if that's worth the money or not. I didn't spend a lot of money, maybe $20. It reached maybe 1,200 people or so they say. I don't know how that actually works. but. That, that's what they, you know, find. And you can pay different increments of money to get a bigger audience. What did you want to do? Well, I was doing a launch party. So people from Chicago are not going to come to this thing. So, you know, I just used the, the main area, Cleveland and Twinsburg, you know, surrounding area to get those people's attention. Um, now, this past time when I did a uh, Facebook ad for something that I can't even remember what it was for, it might have been the launch of my second book. Um, you know, I did a, a little broader um, demographic with it, and now they also post it on Instagram, too. So that, that really helped. I thought that was something nice, that, they, you know, it's on two different sites. So you could do that. Um, also, you can just post things, you know, and 
when you, you know, you have your writer friends and everything and people repost for you and just, you know, randomly people will see it and be like, oh yeah, I want to get this book or I like noodles too. Well, in my situation, I mean, yours could be, you know, cat's pies, you know, romance, what, whatever. Um, but people will see you and they'll see you in the oddest places and you'll be like, really? That's okay. Yeah. So, you know, whatever, you, just promote yourself as much as you can without overdoing it. Because like I said, you do want people to know you as a person. And also the promotional photos. You might want to get those ready in advance. Sorry, how much do you promote yourself on social media? Do you post once a day or do you do it like three times a week or? Well, I try to post once a day. It doesn't really work out that way. Only because, well, it depends on where I am in the writing process. If I'm closer to deadline, I'm going to post less. Um, sometimes I'll disappear for a week at a time. Um, when your book is launching, it is really important. That first week is crucial um, to get the word out and everything like that. So you want to try and, you know, get something out there. I think, too, it depends on how I overthink things a lot. So a lot of times I, you know, I'll think about a post and it, I'll say, well, the wording isn't right, and then forget it, and then I'll get mad, and you know, it takes three hours to make that photo. I mean, that's what, you know. So it just depends on how you want to look at things. Like a lot of people, too, will do this stuff in advance, which really is what I'm trying to get myself under a schedule. Some people, they'll, you know, you can schedule posts. So they will schedule five, one for each, you know, whatever, and then they'll have them just come out. You know, I, my hat's off to those people because you know, I can't get it together that well. But, you know, you can't, there's uh, ways around, you know, making sure that you post. I, I see some people, they post all day long. Um, some people post once a day. I try to keep it to once a day. Um, it, and it's enough for me to handle too, you know. So it kind of depends on how much time you're willing to give to social media. Some people can do a lot more. Um, so now that we've covered that, I'm going to tell you guys the noodle story. Wait, hold on, let me. Oh yeah, okay, 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 we're gonna go back. So, the noodle story. Well, the cooking story, really. So here's the big secret about me, is that I don't cook Chinese food. And everybody has been asking why there are no recipes in my book. This is a question that I get every time that I am somewhere. Why? Well, my mom didn't want me in the kitchen ever. And it was just easier for her, you know, to make the food and she didn't really want to involve me in the process. Part of that is my impatience. Um, so right when uh, I had, you know, moved out of my house, I had emailed, or not emailed her. Why would I email her from the grocery store? I had called her from the grocery store and I was standing in the ethnic aisle which is the size of my toe. But I didn't want to go to the east side, um, and I just, you know, I live right by a giant eagle. I'm like, I'm just going to wing it. So I went there, and I was looking for Shanghai noodles, because this is what my recipe needed. And I'm looking on the shelf, and there's nothing that says that on there. I'm like, well, now what am I going to do? Because I don't know what they are. So I called my mom, and I said, what are Shanghai noodles? And she said, what do you need to know that for? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to try this recipe. I want to make these noodles. And it says Shanghai noodles. You don't need that. Why do you need to make it yourself? What are you doing? I'm making dinner. You don't need to do. You're one person. Why can't you just go to Sakyo, Japan? Do you guys know what Sakyo, Japan is? They're not around anymore. It's like a fast food Japanese restaurant they used to have in malls every place. And the guy would stand outside and ask you if you wanted a sample. Right? Now I said it, and you got like, sample, sample, yeah. So, and I, side note, I used to work for Sakyo Japan when I was younger, um, and I was that girl. Would you like to try a sample? Would you like to try a sample? It was humiliating, and I had to wear a visor, and I looked stupid in hats. I mean, it was awful. <sighs> so anyways, so she said, why can't you just go to Sakyo Japan and get the noodles? I said, I want to learn. She said, you're always trying to cause trouble. I said, never mind, mother. I will figure it out. So she called me back and said, just use spaghetti. Just use spaghetti. So I did. 
And it turned, I mean, it turned out fine. I wouldn't make it for you guys or anything. But, you know, so my, my struggle into learning family recipes and everything, obviously, you know, was not happening. Uh, my sister tried to teach me later, and I had no patience. You know, she tried to teach me how to fold a dumpling. No, that didn't go well at all. Um, so I kind of just gave up for a while, because who's going to notice you know, except for select people. Well, now it's the whole freaking world is asking me, you know, why can't you cook Chinese food? I don't know, I'm sorry. So a lot of, um, a lot of the book really takes the vantage point of the service industry, which I do know about, because I did work in a Chinese restaurant, I worked at Sakyo Japan as well, and, you know, I felt like I wanted to do something different too, you know, because most of the books, the person is the cook. You know, so this time the person is the server. And I felt like, well, I'm going to, you know, do this, you know, different aspect of it. And it's going to work out for me because then people won't ask me for recipes. But they do anyways. So my recommendation to you is if you have anything to do in the future with something like that, maybe consider if you know recipes or not because people love it. So this one lady was, like, really mad at me. And she's like, well, I don't understand. And I told the Shanghai noodle story. She was like, why don't you know what Shanghai noodles are? Did your mom not teach you anything? No, she didn't. <laughs> but she was really upset about it. And so she told me that I need to go take a cooking class so that I can add recipes in the back of my book. So I have been experimenting on Pinterest, you know, because I love Pinterest. So I've been going on there looking for recipes and everything. Um, it's not going that great. Uh, I can cook other things, but Asian food I feel like is really hard because the sauces. So the sauce makes it a little bit more difficult for me, and I can't seem to get the right flavoring, and a lot of it ends up too spicy or too bitter. So I kind of, you know, I mean, i got to eat this stuff after I make it, so I'm trying to take a break. Like, I can make a killer lasagna if you want that, but I, you know... Forget the Shanghai noodles. So, Okay, author events. So those are m more fun things that you get to do after um, people will ask you to do things, which I was very surprised about because I thought, who's going to ask me to do anything? No one. Because um, I'm nobody. You know, who are these people? So then these people are contacting me, and they're like, hey, Vivian, we want you to do this podcast. And I'm like, how did you find out about me? You just... You don't expect these things to happen, but they do. So be prepared for that, too. Um, I've been asked to do a couple of panels, which always made uh, me feel a little bit easier. Having to do this, stand up here, is horrible. <laughs> and, and it's wonderful at the same time. Um, it's, so I was a trainer for U.S. Bank for a short time, and I had my first ever get in front of people. I had to speak in front of 100, de, uh, 100 people in the default department, and I you know, had to tell them how to do their job. And it was very frustrating because I was a new person at the bank, and these people had been there for several years, and I'm telling them what to do. And they were like, that's not right. You don't know what you're talking about. And it was, it was very hard, and I thought... When I left that job, I'm never going to have to do this again. And then you become an author, and nobody tells you that this is what you're going to do. Because you think, I'm going to write books, and I'm going to hide behind this book cover and be fine. No, you have to go places. You have to talk to people. Probably you guys are going to talk to me when we're done here. You know what I mean? Like, but you don't think that. You're not thinking that. All you're thinking is, I'm going to write this book, hopefully it makes it on the shelf, and I'm not embarrassing myself where it's in the dollar bin, and people are like, I don't want that. So that's, that's where you're at. You know, you don't think. Like, people are going to ask me questions. Tell me what your book's about. I don't know. <laughs> it's about murder. There's dumplings somewhere in there, and there's a black pug. I don't know. I still can't tell you what the book's about. It, but you freeze, you know, and you, so get up there and talk about your book. I have no idea what it's about. It's called Death by Dumpling. The cover is red. There's dumplings on it, and there's murder in there, that, and that's usually what I go with. And, you know, and I try to tell people. So I went, I, this summer, I was at uh, Logan Berry Books at their um, author alley, 
And this woman comes up to me. She's got, you know, glasses on, the, the readers. And she looks at me like that. Tell me what your book's about. <laughs> so right away, I feel like I'm being scrutinized. And I was like, well, uh, so the main character, her name is Lana Lee. And she's, so what is it about, though? And I was like, well, so she has to go work at her parents' restaurant, and uh, she, she, she doesn't want to. And she was like, is there murder in it? I'm like, well, yeah, it's death by dumpling. She said, okay, I'll take it. I was like, okay, okay, that worked out. So then the next guy came, same thing. He was like, death by dumpling? Did that really happen to somebody? I'm like, maybe, somebody. He's like, did you write it in your book? I said, no, it's not a real story. It's not. What is it then? Well, it's a mystery novel. It's fiction. That's weird. He didn't buy a book, but he did take a sucker from my book. So you, so you do get to do these fun things and talk to people, and sometimes it's awkward. And a la- I had a lady ask me if my book was a guide. I won't finish that sentence because I see that most of you get it. She asked me if it was a guide, and I was like, no, no. And she was genuinely disappointed. So... <clears throat> You know, being, you know, the fairs are fun and going to the conventions are fun and you get to meet people and, you know, just put yourself out there. Um, try, you know, try to remember what your name is. Do you have a book? What is it about? Remember those things. Um, panels have always been easier for me because I'm there. Us- most of the time I'm with friends. Um, I just did a really great panel in Berea. Right? It was Berea? Yeah, it was at Baldwin Wallace. I was with the lovely Amanda Flower and a couple of my other friends and... It was great because you're all, you know, you flow so well together, you know each other, you don't know each other 100%, but you know each other well enough that, you know, you guys can kind of go off each other. Um, in September, I went to St. Petersburg for uh, BoucherCon there, and I was on a panel with Barbara Ross, who is amazing and hysterical, and I love her. Um, and uh, a friend of mine, Brie Baker, and I think that was it. No, I think, no, there was, I think, one other woman there, because someone had canceled. And people were just hysterical. And they came up to us after, and they said, you guys should go on a road show. I'm like, I will get the Winnebago, whatever, like, this was great. And it, you know, I really have to say that it was Barbara Ross. She, had, you know, is established, and I feel like most of the people were there for her. And <laughs> um, the food, the, the panel was about culinary mysteries. Thankfully, none of us really were like cookie people, mm-hmm. cooking, cookie, whatever, you know what I mean. So none of us were really that, and we kind of played off of each other, you know, and it was very funny. But then I went on another panel where everyone was very serious, and nobody laughed. And they asked me, a woman afterwards asked me if um, I wasn't allowed to go in the kitchen because it was a cultural thing. And I was like, no, no, just my mom. It's just my mom, specifically my mom. Um, I can be a handful. I'm not going to lie. But um, so the the panel was very serious, and no one thought I was funny, and I was the only one who didn't know how to cook the food that was in their book. And it was very uncomfortable. So, you know, and I'm already nervous when I got there, and I'm thinking... This is going to be fun because the last one was fun and it was really good and all of it's going to go well and it didn't go that well. So, I mean, you have, you know, you have times that, that go better than others, but it's all part of the experience. It's all part of, you know, getting yourself out there, getting people to know who you are. And it's the same thing as when people review your book. There are at least five people more, I'm sure, but I, you know... I'm not going to count all of you, but there's at least five people in this room who don't like me. I guarantee you. And, and that's okay, because that's statistically accurate. Some people are going to leave tonight and say, so I went to the library tonight, and it was a total waste of time, because Vivian is a weirdo. And that's okay, because that, you know, so you've got to prepare yourself for that. You've got to have, you know, the realistic view of that. Not everybody's going to like you in the real world. 
So not everyone's going to like your book. Not everyone's going to like what you have to say. And that's okay, you know, because you still, you do you. But, you know, if you're writing, even if you're not published, go to this stuff. Meet people. Rub elbows. Whatever you need to do. Get your business card. Get your website. Get it going. Let people know who you are. And that's another thing that's expected of you, you know, when you're... Just because... Like, a lot of people, I've talked to self-published people a lot in the recent year. And a lot of people assume that I have it made, that I don't have to do anything. And I had a guy come up to me, actually, at one of the fairs and say, well, you don't know what the struggle is. You got everything handed to you. You got a top five publisher, St. Martin's, that's a pretty fancy name. I mean, he was really, you know, upset. And I almost, you know, and I... I I was standing there and I was thinking, "How what a nice man he is. And then he started talking to me and I was like, oh my, <laughs> like, I'm a little taken aback, you know. Um, so the reality of that is, is that's not reality. You know, they do help, I'm not going to lie. Having the St. Martin's uh, emblem on my book helps a lot. Um, you know, people give you this look a lot. Oh, yeah, St. Martin's, that's fancy. Um, and then other people are like, who's St. Martin's? What is that? Is that... You did that yourself? I'm like, oh, geez. But so there are people who they don't know and they don't care, you know, because that doesn't matter to them. So it, it doesn't get you a free pass. Um, I am so thankful. Um, St. Martin's, I, I love them as a company because, you know, this, the books that they publish and, the, you know, the things in recent times, um, just they're great. And I love my editor. And I'm not just saying that. I, I mean, I really mean it. Um, but it doesn't mean that I don't have to do my own work. You still have to put yourself out there. You still have to put forth money. They don't pay for everything. Um, really, I mean, they did my, my Facebook and Twitter banners. Um, and, you know, I've written a blog for their um, criminal element page. And, you know, and they put me out there and they, you know, promote me and posts and stuff on, on Instagram. But I still have to do stuff. You still have to put forth the effort if you want to shine. If you want to be, a, you know, above the others and make your book stand out, you definitely have to do that yourself, you know. So just because you get picked by a publishing company doesn't mean you get a free pass. So, it, you know, I mean, granted, self-published people, they do have to do every single aspect of that themselves. Um, which I give them a lot of credit for because I'd screw the whole thing up. I mean, just the cover alone, I would mess it up. Okay, and this is the end. So, this uh, photo is, which you probably can't see it that well, is from a girl's story on Instagram. So she posted, which I should have posted the picture too if I was thinking. She posted a really great picture of my book with a Chinese dinner spread. And it was a great picture. I mean, I was super hungry after that. So it did the job, you know, and just had my book kind of in the corner and everything, and she had just read my book. So I thought it was great, and I reposted it. And she was so appreciative of it. She thanked me and everything. And then she thanked me in her story. And that's what it says to, you know, to follow me, and then it has fangirling right now. Thank you, Vivian Chen. Fangirling right now okay this is amazing for me and I'll tell you why because I am the fangirl I am the embarrassing girl who goes up to people and is like oh my god you're you the first time I met Casey Daniels I was like oh my god you're Casey Daniels and she was like well yeah that's that's who I am I mean she's a totally she's a cool lady and she's not full of herself at all and you know she has like 60 books out or something crazy and it, she's just her you know I met Heather Graham amazing woman and I she's like I love your hair she's like you just have the cutest hair and I'm like oh my god Heather Graham love my hair you know and I'm like I'm never changing my hair ever I mean I am the fangirl I am the one who goes and embarrasses themselves every place that you can imagine and here's this girl that read my book and now she's having a fangirl moment and that's me and so that's why I put this up here to never stop trying never stop pushing forward all of you in here who want to write a book write it 
don't let anybody ever tell you that you can't do it. Because people told me over and over again, this is never gonna happen. You might as well just give it up. So just do it. Just keep writing. Even if you think it's bad, let someone else be the judge. Send it out to people. Look for an agent. Just see what happens. Believe that you can actually do it. Because honestly, I never thought I'd be standing here. I never thought that I would be able to tell anybody that I have a book with St. Martin's, that I have a series. I have just gotten another contract a couple months ago for three more books. From being, you know, people will say, well, you gotta live someplace, or you gotta do something, or you gotta know somebody. Not necessarily. Because I'm a nobody from Parma, Ohio. Okay, like, and you don't think that stuff is gonna happen. And it does. It can happen. You know, it's hard. It is hard, and it sucks. Sometimes it really sucks bad. But it is so worth it in the end. So if you have that passion, if you want to have your name on a book, someone may write this about you one day. So absolutely do it up. I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you so much. Feel free to contact me. Um, my website, I think, is on those papers. Right? Is it there? Oh, yes. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. For wit. Oh, no, no. Okay, so I didn't finish up with that story. So they ended up getting it that following week. They had, they had two shipments. So... I think that that is, is generally geared towards more of a um, lesser known or maybe like self-published people they would have to. So what you would have to do is you'd have to submit a copy of your book to the headquarters. And they have, you know, they have it on their website. There, there's a section for authors and you would send it there. So your publisher took care of that for you? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, oh. Do we have time for questions? Uh, maybe one more question. Okay. I just want to know what the line is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, the line. So she wants to know what the line was for Detective Trudeau. So it was actually, um, so it was Lana and Detective Trudeau were talking, and the bartender who was also Lana's best friend, Megan, they were all congregated. And he, you know what's terrible is I can barely remember it. But he says something, maybe, you know, maybe you should mind your own business or, or he says something like maybe that's why you're always in trouble or something like that, something really snide. Now I have to find it, oh. And then, but the bartender, which is the part that I like, the best friend, she says, well, maybe that's why you're single. And I was like, ooh, burn. Like, <laughs> Detective Trudeau got burned. But he, I mean, he said something, you know, kind of like, well, maybe you need to, like, mind your own business, something along those lines. And he, you know, Megan just comes back with that. And that's, and that's what I really wanted in the story. So what uh, my editor wanted me to do was get rid of his line and leave Megan's line. But it just didn't flow anymore without it. So... I'll have, to, I'll have to look for the specific wording of it, but I was so sad. It was a great... But looking back on it, it did kind of make him look like a jerk. You know? Thank you so much, guys.